in part to obtain FISA warrants. People within law enforcement are concerned that they were using this dossier to find a way to look into the Trump campaign. President Trump is standing firm for his border wall. Any solution has to include the wall because without the wall, it all doesn't work. All eyes on a controversial surveillance vote today by the House to renew the NSA's warrantless spy program. If we do not put the F back in FISA, it becomes ISA, and the American public should know that the eyes are on them. Senator Feinstein added this ridiculous apology for publicly releasing the closed door testimony of Fusion GPS. I've had a bad cold, and maybe that slowed down my uh, mental facilities a little bit. Yep, he sang that song on this here program, Parking Lot Party. <laughs> this here program. That's all. Hey, come on that's in. It's a great song, isn't it? Parking Lot Party, that's what everyone does. College football, you yeah, tailgate absolutely. beforehand, before a concert. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you should go. In your neck of the woods, there's a place called, what is that? Something Beach, where I've been to a concert. Jones Beach. Jones Beach. Jones Beach. Go to a Jimmy Buffett concert there. What do you do? Most people drink margaritas or they want a pre-party. In the parking lot? You right. can't drink in the concert. It's hard for him to sing over the blender on the ice machine. No, you can't. Uh, because that... he has to make a lot of noise. I was he just... puts it on, they put it on Crush. I was wondering why he chose that venue, though, because you can't drink inside. So everyone was drinking on the outside, and then you go in, and right. you can't. Can you tell we're already thinking about closing time on Friday? <laughs> I know, right? I know. Absolutely. <laughs> Lots anyway, of news to talk about. No kidding. Let's start at the very beginning. We have been telling you all along uh, there have been some suspicions among Republican lawmakers. Was that dirty dossier, which is completely unproven except for one thing that Carter Page did in fact go to uh, Russia. Russia, was that dossier used to uh, put in front of a FISA judge so that the federal government could officially, via the FBI and the Department of Justice, spy on that man, Donald Trump, and his associates? And now we know the answer is yes, apparently the dossier was used to get a FISA warrant maybe more than once. Sarah Carter is the investigative reporter that we have continuously interviewed on this and she has a lot of sources that are telling her. She has three sources she told Sean Hannity last night that have confirmed yes the dirty dossier was used in part to spy on the Trump campaign. Unquote. Listen to her last night. I have spoken to a number of sources, one senior law enforcement official and another in the DOJ, uh, and the dossier was absolutely used as part of the FBI's ability to gain a warrant uh, to basically spy on members of the Trump campaign. We know, coming from the mouths of members, senior members of the FBI who testified, both Comey and McCabe, that the only part of the dossier that they were able to confirm that was actually factual was that Carter Page had actually traveled to Moscow. Um, everything else in the dossier, apparently they did not talk about that. They did not confirm. There are a number of sources that are alarmed about this, particularly people within law enforcement uh, who are concerned that they were using this dossier uh, to, to find a way to look into the Trump campaign. So what's the significance of this? Mm -hmm. Well, if you give $10 million to an oppor opposition research firm, which seven point something uh, from Hillary Clinton's camp, and about three from the DNC, and it's really the same thing because we found out uh, from Donna Brazile's book that the Hillary Clinton camp bailed out the Democratic National Committee and basically had made it an arm of the Clinton camp. So if you pay somebody $10 million to find something out about your opponent, and then that information is given to the FBI to spur a, some type of FISA warrant to go up to a court and says, listen, we, we have this proof. Right. Now we need a warrant to unmask or follow or tap these people's phones. What does it say about this entire process? And you got the clue that they were hiding something when the FBI was asked over and over again, as long as even the Department of Justice, hand over the information about the FISA warrants, what went into uh, getting them. And they just refused to do it, well, even when Chris Ray took over. There's so many questions here, and the focus now is on the FBI. Did they go to the secret court and get this, uh, this, this FISA warrant like to spy on the president's campaign? Did they do that with an unverified dossier? If the only thing they verified was right. that Carter Page went over to Russia. Nothing in that 35 pages was verified. It's unbelievable.
unbelievable. That is unbelievable. And the second thing that they want to know, Sarah Carter was talking about, I read an article that she wrote saying the next thing they want to know is did the FBI pay for this dossier? Well, on the Hannity program last night, both he and Sarah Carter said that they both heard that uh, perhaps either uh, James Comey or Andrew McCabe themselves paid for through the FBI for the dossier. But just the fact that they could have used just a folder full of made up stuff. Opposition research, they took it to a court, the FBI did, and weaponized that to spy on Americans is unbelievable. And that's some of the frustration the president feels and has felt and expressed yesterday. Watch. There is collusion, but it's really with the Democrats and the Russians far more than it is with the Republicans and the Russians. So the witch hunt continues. There has been no collusion between the Trump campaign and Russians or Trump and Russians. No collusion. It's a Democrat hoax that was brought up as an excuse for losing an election that frankly the Democrats should have won because they have such a tremendous advantage in the Electoral College. So it was brought up for that reason. So if you read last week's editorial from Glenn Kessler, the founder of uh, GPS, and he says, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I need all these transcripts released to show how viable and how reputable uh, Fusion GPS is. You could drive a truck through some of his explanations. One of those explanations was that the FBI corroborated most of which was in the dossier, and that is why Christopher Steele had so much credit. Well, really, when, when James Comey turned around and talked to uh, President-elect Trump, he said unverified, salacious material. Right. And now we find out it was, was not only corroborated, it was used in many cases to get these FISA right. warrants. And the other problem is, is that they say they had a mole, the FBI had a mole inside the Trump camp giving this information. Turns out he might have misspoke and it's not a mole. It was Papadopoulos, a drunken conversation with an Australian ambassador who told right. officials after the Podesta emails hit the, right. uh, hit the fire that this was out there. You just mentioned George Papadopoulos. Remember, it was about uh, two weeks ago, the New York Times had that big exclusive story that apparently it was George Papadopoulos that was the reason, he, you know, the, the drunken things he had said, and that's what got the collusion investigation rolling. It reminds me. That's you. nothing to that it. Reminds it was Benghazi with the video? Yeah, exactly. Right, so yesterday the president was at the White House. He was sitting down with all of his cabinet members, and he was touting his accomplishments. This was the first cabinet meeting of 2018. Listen to some of the things that he accomplished in the first year. 2017 was a year of tremendous achievement. I don't think any administration has ever done, has done what we've done and what we've accomplished in its first year, which isn't quite finished yet. We confirmed an incredible new Supreme Court justice and more circuit court judges in our first year than any administration in the history of our country. We've set a new record on reducing regulation. The records that we set, 22 to 1, nobody's ever come close. We passed the largest tax cut and reform in American history, and including the fact that the individual mandate was terminated. People are supposed to pay for the privilege of not having health care. That was not good. See, if you have the president over the last uh, two days, if he continues to deliver uh, uh, in so many ways, uh, this, if his uh, administration continues to deliver, if they can take off some type of immigration deal, and the president can deliver that tone and not put his chin out every day in provocative tweets, no matter how accurate you think it is mm -hmm. and how entertaining they often are. It'll allow the moderates to get his approval rating up along with something like this Quinnipiac poll because when people are asked about the economy, and that's a per very personal question, how's the economy to you? 66% says it's excellent or good, and 33% say not so good or poor. Those numbers usually mean 50-plus approval rating for the president in office. That is the highest number the Quinnipiac poll has ever had since they were asking that question in 2001. Mm -hmm. And so you can see that uh, 2017 ended with flourish, ended on a high note for the president. There were a lot of setbacks. And a lot of them, you've got to figure, could have been in part due to the mainstream me media coverage of the administration. I mean, you look at, for instance, if you looked at the uh, three big three networks, their coverage from January 3rd through the 9th, you looked at their morning shows, you looked at their nighttime shows, and if they had a choice between covering the Michael Wolff book, Fire and Fury, or Dow 25,000, which has never been achieved in humankind, look at that. Look at the disparity. 
Wow. Five minutes covering the Dow, two hours, 20 minutes, and five seconds covering that book. All right, so you remember that book was supposed to come out on Tuesday of this week. It came out last Friday because there was so much hype over it. The hype started a few days before that, and that's what this poll looks at. This yeah. poll looks at last Wednesday, two days before the book came out, up until Tuesday of this week when the book was supposed to but come out. But I understand out. it. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We covered it more than the Dow. It should be a little bit closer. But when you come out and say when the president's chief confidant, Steve Bannon, turns on the president and urges other people to cooperate on an inside uh, the administration book, I get it. But the balance could have been a little bit different if the, the people point. didn't want to jump on. That's the point. We, did, didn't we covered both stories. Anti -Trump. But, we, but we, I think we covered the Dow much more. It'd be interesting oh, for us to find out how much we did. But we also covered the FBI reopening the investigation into the Clinton Foundation, and they only covered that to the tune of 11 minutes. Right. Keep in mind, when it came to Dow 25,000, how many? How much time do you think ABC spent on it? Take a how guess. Much? Twenty-three seconds. Twenty-three <laughs> seconds. That's all. But right. the Wolf Book, holy cow! And by the way, if you are online buying Fire and Fury, oh, yeah, apparently <laughs> a lot of people are buying the wrong Fire and Fury. It's a book about World War II, and that guy's just shooting through the roof <laughs> on Amazon. Oh God! And one of the reviewers said. I don't understand. There's nothing about Trump in here. <laughs> it's a Canadian book, too. How long, how long do we spend tossing a Jillian? Have we done a study on that? More than 23 seconds. Really? Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, like, if you would like to prolong this, then you can, Brian. I don't think I, people I in think the control room might get mad. I'll be open to, open to too much criticism in the control room. And that's, <laughs> they that's worked my so earpiece. hard to put the show together. So I know. Let's start with and then we just mess it up. <laughs> All right, guys, good morning to morning. you. Let's start with the Fox News alert right now. Overnight, the Air Force deploying three nuclear-capable B-2 stealth bombers to Guam meant to send a strong message to North Korea. These brand new pictures show the bombers on their way to the U.S. territory. 200 airmen also deployed to Guam. This comes just a day after Vice President Mike Pence vowed that the White House would put maximum pressure on North Korea as he prepares to lead the U.S. Olympic delegation in South Korea next month. To extreme weather now, a race against time at this hour to find people still missing in those devastating and deadly California mudslides. Staggering amounts of rain triggering raging rivers of mud and debris running down hillsides taking anything and everything with it we're stuck in our house we're not able to get out we're running low on food we're hoping we can get south a little bit to, to pick up some food but i don't know if we can even get there the hardest hit area montecito where thousands are now without power 17 people have died over 100 homes have been destroyed hundreds more are damaged House Majority Whip Steve Scalise is resting comfortably after successful follow-up surgery. He's expected to work through his recovery and return to the Capitol in the next few weeks. This procedure comes months after Scalise was ambushed and shot in the hip by a lone gunman at congressional baseball practice. Doctors say he was close to death when the bolt ripped through bones and organs. Three other people were shot and survived. Let's look at your headlines. I will send it back to you guys. This whole time, though, Steve Scalise has been nothing but positive energy. He's always smiling. He, you know. Has a good outlook. Been through a lot. Mm -hmm. No kidding. All right, All right Jillian. God, thanks, Jillian. Thank 13 minutes now left to the hour. Uh, illegals caught hiding in the in this semi, but they didn't go to jail. They went straight to Catholic Charities? Question mark exclamation point. We can't make this up. Plus, Diane Feinstein opens up about why she released that Fusion GPS testimony. And it's not a happy it's, story. It's genius. I've kind of, I don't make an excuse, but I've had a bad cold, and maybe that slowed down my... Uh, mental facilities a little bit. New questions this morning after the San Antonio police chief allowed a dozen illegal immigrants found in a semi truck to go free. Joining us right now is the president of the San Antonio Police Officers Association, Detective Mike Kelly, who wants the police chief put on leave. So, the police chief, this is a very odd situation, the police chief has gone soft on illegal immigrants. Why has he defied his own, uh, his own state's law, sir? Well, I think that's a question that uh, I've asked our city manager, asked our mayor uh, and city council to that very question, that uh, we need to have a higher authority uh, with jurisdiction either at the state level or uh, with the Department of Justice answer that very question. But just some breaking news that happened late last night. Um, we had spent, uh, my vice president and I, um, along with my legislative director, had spent most of the afternoon uh, at our capital, Texas Capitol, excuse me, <clears throat> and 
we met with the folks up there in the lieutenant governor's office. We met with the governor's office themselves and uh, and their attorneys, and they have already issued a uh, based on our testimony a cease and desist not cease and desist but a uh, basically notifying the uh, San Antonio Police Department, especially Chief McManus, that he is not allowed to touch or any of the evidence that's involved in this. They are not allowed to destroy anything. They are not allowed to do anything at all whatsoever. They are to preserve every single piece of evidence that is involved in this incident so that they have the ability to come down here and begin an investigation. Chief, so McManus, about that. Uh, Chief McManus says that um, they refer to the he refers to the 12 uh, illegal immigrants as victims. You say they're a party to the offense committed. That's correct. As a matter of fact, uh, he keeps intertwining the definitions. Uh, for your viewers, if they don't know, uh, uh, human trafficking is, is completely different than human smuggling. Human trafficking can actually uh, has an element of enslaving somebody that's brought into the country illegally. Predominantly, it has a sexual uh, connotation to it where you're forcing people into uh, prostitution or some other uh, uh, horrible uh, kind of crime such as that and human smuggling is the actual act of right. uh, the person trying to get across the country paying a fee or service into being transportation uh, into our country so completely different um, they are a party to uh, or to right. the uh, criminal offense so so michael uh, essentially you, texas did what uh, california the exact opposite they said we're a sanctuary state uh, texas says no no we we are not a sanctuary. we're uh, we're going to make sure that uh, the entire state there are no sanctuary cities. But the police chief is not on board. In fact, the police uh, department statement is this. Homeland Security was never told their services were not needed. So SAPD handled this investigation utilizing the state smuggling uh, statute. So this police chief is not going to get on board. So you want him on desk duty until he does, or do you want him relieved? Well, I think he needs to be removed from the police department completely and put in plain clothes while this investigation takes place because as the chief of police, he still has the ability to have influence over the subordinates underneath him. But one thing that's important to note is what's even more critical uh, and even more dangerous, in my opinion, and scary is, is that even the, the very narrative that you just described that the chief has said that he did yep. is false. That is not what happened at the scene, and that's the story that has not come out public yet that I tried to get counsel and the mayor to listen to, but they refused to. When law and order can't be put, to, uh, put, uh, put forward by the chief, there's a problem. Michael Helley, thanks so much. Thank Next, you for at least listening to us. You Thank got you. it. An aspiring bodybuilder. Network supporting Hezbollah. The Hezbollah financing and uh, narco-terrorism team will work on stopping violent drug trafficking and restricting the flow of money to terrorists with aggressive prosecutions. And a top U.S. military advisor under fire for threatening to kill ISIS terrorists with a shovel. Army Command Sergeant Major John Wayne Troxell posting this picture on Facebook with the caption, if they choose not to surrender, then we will kill them with extreme prejudice, whether that be by dropping bombs on them, shooting them in the face, or beating them to death with our entrenching tools. And that is something that you can easily. Okay, thank you, Steve. A 21-year-old aspiring bodybuilder dies just a few days after catching the flu, and he is not the only victim. Just yesterday, Ohio confirmed two young boys a one-year-old and a four-year-old also died of the flu. So when should you go see the doctor if you think you have the flu? Dr. Nicole Sapphire has the answers for us. First of all, before we get to that, how do you know the difference in just a common cold and the flu, Dr. Sapphire? Well, you know, this is devastating what's going on right now, and this is becoming an epidemic, deadly flu season. And a lot of people are walking around with congestion and a cough right now, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have the flu. It's very important to distinguish symptoms of the flu, and that is fever, chills, body aches, and headache, in addition to that cough and congestion. Okay, so when do you go see your doctor? That's a, that's a great question, and unfortunately, there's not a right answer. There's not a check this, 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 and you absolutely have to go. If you have a chronic illness, if you have diabetes, you're overweight, lung disease, heart disease, you are absolutely increased risk of getting severe flu symptoms. So if you have flu symptoms, again, fever, chills, body aches, headaches, you know, you can stay home for the most part, rest, drink a lot of fluids, but if you start finding yourself chest pain, difficulty breathing, severe headaches, confusion, or 
you're elderly or a young child, you really need to go see your physician. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure you're under the care of someone. And then parents with young kids, you hear the story, the one-year-old, the four-year-old, the 21-year-old. Do we, what do we do when we start seeing symptoms in our little ones? Yes, I mean, we both have little yeah. ones at home, and this is, this is terrifying. Um, really, you have to watch them because they're sick all the time during this season. Mm -hmm. You know, ear, you know, Running nose constantly. Every, all, every day. So you want to just know your child. You know if your child isn't normal. Lethargy, meaning very tired. They're just not getting up. They're not playing. Vomiting so much that they're not taking in water. You, keep an eye out for that. Or the persistent fevers. Even, even for little ones at this point, even at the slightest thought of having the flu, you should go see your doctor because there are some medications we can give to lessen the duration and lessen severity. You know, okay. you don't want to be the parent that says, what if, I, what if I took them in earlier? What else could I have done? Right, right. A lot of people got the flu shot. Does it really work? I've had two friends. I want to ask that. First, does it work? Yes or no? Sorry, and then I've got another one. So it absolutely does work. It's not 100% effective, mm -hmm. but it does have, it does prevent anywhere from 40 to 60 people from getting the flu. And not only that, if it doesn't prevent you from getting the flu, it can lessen your symptoms or severity and absolutely can decrease your risk of dying from the flu. Okay. So even though this flu vaccine may not be the most effective we've seen, we still recommend everyone get it. And don't just get it for yourself. Get it for your little girl at home. Mm -hmm. Get it for your elderly mm -hmm. relatives. You need to protect those around you as well. So 40 to 60 percent of those who get it will not get the flu. Right. Okay. Also, I've had two friends my age who have gotten the flu this year. They have been in bed for an entire week. One of my friends during the holidays, she couldn't wrap presents. She had to hire someone to do all the wrapping. She said her kids were opening presents and she doesn't even really remember it. She was just in a daze. She said, I can completely understand how people do die of the flu. It is a bad year. And this strain is H3N2. You may remember H1N1. Yeah. That's how people tend to remember the swine flu. This strain H3N2 is essentially a mutation of the virus and it's bad. It is causing severe symptoms in healthy young adults so no one's immune to getting the flu take care of yourself and if you're sick stay home don't be a martyr don't go to work because you're mm -hmm. just infecting everyone don't touch your mouth don't touch your nose mm -hmm. just wash hands stay safe okay good advice thank Thanks, you Dr. Sapphire. next on the rundown an ivy league murder mystery a college student found dead what he did right before he vanished Plus, President Trump hosting a listening session on prison reform, a very personal issue for his son-in-law, Jared. Our next guest is going to be there. Plus, Diane Feinstein opens up about why she released that Fusion GPS testimony. You need to pass the tissues. Nicole, you need to hear this one. Yeah, Boston wrote that song and broke up. I don't know why. Uh, meanwhile, today, happening today, the White House taking on prison reform. And this issue is especially personal to the president's son-in-law and senior advisor, Jared Kushner. Pastor Darrell Scott will be at the White House today and joins us now. So, Pastor, are you behind this initiative to be here, or were you asked to join us? The president has a forum on this. Well, actually, this is not the first conversation that's been had or being had concerning prison reform. It's a, a concern for the president, but it's also a passion for Jared Kushner, that they want to curb this recidivism rate and try to reintegrate former prisoners into American society so that they become productive members of American society rather than to get in that cycle of back and forth in and out of prison. So it's something that this administration is going to be very, very proactive on and has, has a huge concern about. Right, and Pastor, to your earlier point, Jared Kushner is passionate about this because yes, his own is. father went to prison for 18 months and he would fly from New York down to Alabama, according to one article, every weekend to visit with his dad. So he understands what's involved. And you say he's passionate. Uh, you just touched on recidivism. Uh, yes. That's one of the biggest problems is people go to prison and then they get out and they wind up going back. Yes. And so this is a problem that we're looking at. There are a number of solutions on the table. Uh, once again, this is not the first meeting that's going to be had. Maybe it's the first one that's been made public to this extent. But there have been several ongoing meetings. And it, it's something that we really want to look at to find solutions to, once again, reintegrate former prisoners into American society so that they become productive How do you members do of that? society. How do you do that? Well, 
There are a number of, uh, of, of solutions that are on the table, skills training, social programs, um, uh, opportunities that may exist. And then, you know, the nature of the crime oftentimes dictates the rate of recidivism. Some are nonviolent offenses. Some have been crimes of passion. So we're looking at all of it. And he's bringing in experts from all over the country that have been involved in these kind of endeavors for years. It's a, it's a, it's a little think tank of the best and brightest that can be assembled to try to do what is, is the best for this uh, situation. Pastor, why did you get involved in this and what is your message for the president? Well, you know, I have, I have to be honest, I have three nephews, all three of them are in the penitentiary right now, mm -hmm. all three for nonviolent crimes, and some of them have gotten caught in that cycle. Some of them have uh, went back to prison because of technical violations of their probation, different things like that. So all these right. are look, being looked at. But in the black community, this hits close to home. A number of, almost every family, well, a lot of families in the urban community have someone or have been touched by this uh, by, by incarceration. And so it's a problem that we want to curb. And I have a passion. I mean, I, I do happen to be black. And so right. <laughs> I've had family members that have been touched by this. So it's personal to me as well. Surely. Pastor, real quick, the president famously said during the campaign trail to the uh, to minorities, but the black community, what the hell do you have to lose? And essentially, unemployment is down, but we have not seen a major rollout of any type of urban initiative. Is it coming? It's come on the way, I promise you. I will be back on Fox and Friends. You guys will get the skinny first. There's a huge urban initiative that the president and this administration is spearheading that's going to be very beneficial for the urban community. Now, the urban community is not uh, the majority black, as most people would think. The Latinos, Hispanics make up 60% of the urban community. Uh, but there's going to be a huge initiative, public-private partnership that's going to be going forth that's really going to be very beneficial for this nation. And this president and this administration is very, very proactive in it and very aggressive about it as well. Well, you've got a busy day at the White House. Uh, Pastor, thank you very much for starting your day with us here at Fox and Friends. Pastor Darrell thank Scott from me. Cleveland, God Ohio. Bless you. God thank bless you. you too, Pastor. Thank you. All right, let's hand over to Jillian. She has headlines for us. That's right. Good morning, guys. Let's give you an update on a story we've been following for a few days now. The mysterious disappearance of a missing college student is now a homicide investigation. Investigators in Los Angeles discovering 19-year-old Blaze Bernstein's body at the very same park where he vanished one week ago. His parents, as you can imagine, are devastated. So many friends and family that have reached out to us. It's unbelievable what you people have done for us and our son and his memory. Bernstein vanished after he was supposed to meet a friend in the park. Police do not consider that person to be a suspect. Overnight, his classmates holding a candlelight vigil at the University of Pennsylvania. President Trump slamming Senator Dianne Feinstein as sneaky Dianne for releasing the Fusion GPS testimony. So why did she make it public? Well, in part because she has a cold. The one regret I have is that I should have spoken with Senator Grassley before. And uh, I've kind of, I don't make an excuse, but I've had a bad cold, and maybe that slowed down my uh, mental facilities a little bit. There you have it. The Democratic lawmaker also coming under fire for working with Fusion GPS, the firm behind the dossier, to redact large sections of the transcripts. That undercuts her argument that the release was done in the name of transparency. All right, if you're not watching and just listening, come to your TV screen for this one. A Virginia man finds out the hard way that his entire driveway is sheet of black ice. Watch. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> I can't help it. This home security footage going viral to the tune of 40 million views after the man's wife posted it on Facebook. In the caption, she wrote, just another day heading to the office. He was not hurt, thankfully, but uh, maybe his ego is a bit bruised. I saw this yesterday and tweeted it. That I can't get it. That's for the up. mailbox. He would have been in the street. It, well, at least so he, he slid into the grass area. Uh, yeah. I yeah. know. A soft landing and this in was Virginia. His, and this is his first wife, right? Uh, right? Uh, Why would she that? that I don't know. Uh, Facebook. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jillian. All right. Uh, Janice Dean, the weather machine, joins us. And Janice, I just saw one of your other maps. We've got flooding to worry about today. Absolutely. We do have flooding.
flooding. Because uh, So we have a storm system that's going to unfortunately bring slippery conditions to parts of the Tennessee River Valley, the Mississippi River Valley. Want to point out all of this moisture streaming across the upper Midwest. Also want to quickly make mention that Southern California, where we've had those mudslides, a period of drying out. But some of that energy where we did see the heavier rain is pushing into the central U.S. I am concerned about blizzard conditions as well as ice over areas that don't typically see ice or snow, northern Mississippi into Tennessee, Kentucky, the Ohio Valley. So winter storm watches and warnings are in effect. The temperatures here are cold. So behind the system, dealing with another Arctic blast for the northern plains in towards the Midwest. And you can see the future radar. This is what I'm concerned about as we head into Friday. See this line of pink? That's freezing rain, sleet, and ice. And unfortunately, that's in areas that don't typically see this weather. So we'll watch for that. And then mainly a rain event for the northeast. But as Steve pointed out, flood advisories already posted for parts of the northeast in New England. Back to you. They'll just be happy it's rain and not snow. Yep. All right. Winter's not over yet, though. It's not, although it feels like it today. J.D., thank you very much. Meanwhile, coming up on this Thursday, Vermont is about to go to pot without even asking the voters the first of its kind of legislation. Coming up next. Plus, all eyes on a controversial surveillance vote today by the House to renew the NSA's wireless wire, uh, warrantless spy program. Joseph Napolitano uh, likes this issue. He has stuff to say about this issue. He's here to talk about this issue. In a lawsuit followed by a man who claims he was unlawfully detained and handed over to a border patrol in Spokane after being a victim of a car accident in 2014. The city to get a little greener, Vermont is set to become the first in the U.S. to legalize marijuana through its legislature instead of a ballot initiative. The bill does not set out framework for retail sales. Republican Governor Phil Scott is expected to sign the bill, which could go into effect. July 1st. All right, so let's go down to Steve. All right, and the Steve's judge. down in the fishbowl. What are you right. talking about? I'm glad you asked. Brian and Ashley, today House lawmakers are set to vote on whether to renew a controversial surveillance program backed by the White House as a crucial measure in protecting all of us against terrorism. But Judge Napolitano says it puts the constitutional privacy rights of every American at risk. How do you explain that? Well, it's a very dangerous program. Look, in the Nixon era, when President Nixon used the FBI and the CIA to spy on his political opponents, the response to that was FISA, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, right. which said no spying unless done through a warrant, except it permitted warrants for mass bulk spying, that mm -hmm. is, spying on huge numbers of people. Which they do every day. A zip code, an area all code, a customer, a customer list. One of the uh, warrants was for all customers of Verizon. Mm -hmm. That's 115 million people without any suspicion or allegations against any of them. That program is about to expire on January 19th. The president wants it renewed, but he wants it renewed even stronger. He wants it renewed so that if a conversation in its, innocently picked up by, by domestic spies right. reveals like a criminal act. Unrelated that, to terrorism. Uh, correct. Totally unrelated uh, to terrorism that that information can be used in, in the prosecution of, of the crime. That violates the whole purpose of the Fourth Amendment, which is to prevent suspicionless surveillance and to deny the use of that evidence to the police. I know the House Freedom Caucus doesn't like this whole program because so many Americans are targeted, whether we know it or not. But for them, for the White House to be behind the part that will open more Americans up, that's surprising for the administration because it was the FISA and essentially this whole program that got Donald Trump in trouble with the Russian you know, stuff. Not in, his fault. I, in, in my column this morning at foxnews.com and elsewhere, I did my best to explain the history of this and why it's against the Constitution. And at the end, I said, I'm scratching my head. I don't understand why Donald Trump is in favor of this. His woes began right. with unlawful foreign surveillance and unconstitutional domestic surveillance of him before he was the president of the United States. And now he wants to institutionalize this. Mr. President, this is not the way to go. 
Spying is valid to find the foreign agents among us, but it's got to be based on suspicion and not an area code. And judge, it's got to be based on fact. Uh, our lead story today was about how apparently that dirty dossier filled with stuff that was just made up right. apparently was used in part to get a FISA warrant to spy on President Trump and candidate Trump and all of his people. Because they knew that the court is issuing these warrants and it shouldn't be. I don't know where, where this is going to go. Ran, uh, Senator Rand Paul says he's going to filibuster it. That's going to depend on, on and you would how, that. how strong, how long he can stand in the well of the, uh, of the Senate. There are Democrats who oppose it, liberal Democrats, and there are libertarian Republicans who oppose it. We'll see what happens. Uh, one other uh, story that is making news, uh, and that is that apparently Huma and Anthony Weiner are calling off their divorce. They're putting it on hold. And, uh, uh, Don't very, tell me they're reconciling. No, no, no. They're, they say for the privacy of the child and stuff like that. Uh, I had a lawyer send me something yesterday and wondered whether or not they were calling off the divorce for spousal testimony privilege Could if she well were indicted. If, if she is indicted, she can prevent him from testifying against her if so married. long as they are married. Correct. Now, that may be a legal reason for it. They may have practical reasons for it. I don't know where he's in jail, but he's in jail. You can't really manage your litigation while you're in jail. Okay. We'll see where this one goes. No kidding. All right. Judge, thank you very much. I'm off to D.C. with Brett Baer and company today. We'll watch it tonight, 6 thank p.m. You. Eastern. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Meanwhile, President Trump doubles down. No wall, no DACA. Oh, we need the wall for security. We need the wall for safety. We need the wall for stopping the drugs from pouring in. Any solution has to include the wall because without the wall, it all doesn't work. Okay, so what happens next? Is he any closer to a deal? We're going to tell you what we know. And it was New York City's deadliest fire in over 20 years, and our Fox & Friends viewers have stepped up in a huge way. Father Jonathan Morris asked for your help, and he got it. He's here with an update. That's next.